So, uh, and these are the last slides, at least on vaccine, because I know that people are interested. So I thought I would focus on kind of what Pfizer had put out and put this all into context. So what people heard, Pfizer put out a, what they call a phase three study. There's been phase one, phases one and two. Their press release that they put out said, 90% fewer cases of COVID among those vaccinated versus the unvaccinated. They initially thought it was going to be some number between 60 and 70%. So 60 to 70% would be good. 90% fewer would even be better. But notice I've also put the word press release. While we have no reason to believe they would put out false information, a press release is not a scientific study. So there's a process that has to happen, but let's continue. They make the point the efficacy of the study may change in the end as more data comes in. So they did reported this about three quarters of the way through a phase three, as I understand. But that still means they have a couple more weeks of data that, that have to come in, just like the laboratory data that we've talked about. So it's possible it could change, but I, I'm going to make the assumption that their scientists were believed it enough because they know that this is going to also have an economic impact on their believability. They're not going to make this. Up. And based on this, if their techniques are working well, the other vaccine makers are doing similar things. And Pfizer vaccine gets messenger RNA technology. The one thing that has to be pointed out is right now, there's never been an mRNA product that has ever been approved. Doesn't mean it won't be, but this is a way of saying this is new technology. They have really been the one thing calling it Operation Warp Speed in that sense has been appropriate. I think they are trying to do things differently. The FDA has to consider a vaccine under an EUA or emergency use authorization once one half of the patients are observed for at least two months or greater following their second dose. So it's my way of first reminding people, most of the vaccines that are being considered are going to require two doses you get dose one and the second one would have to happen two to four weeks later uh, to get full benefit of the vaccine. So they have to have done all of those in those first phases and they are looking to complete that number of patients being observed for at least two months and looking at the safety profile. They're not going to send it forward if it's got a horrible safety pro profile, but we won't know until we hear that there's been an FDA submission. So this is a bright spot, and now I'm going to talk about the caveats. There is no information yet on whether the vaccine prevents severe cases from happening, those who would need hospitalization or those who die, because there just hasn't been time. It's been good that they haven't seen that, but you can't make some of those conclusions because it all depends on who they vaccinated. They vaccinated about 44,000 people, great number, but that's not as good as over years and years of experience. We also have no information about if this vaccine can prevent the carriage of virus in the nose to prevent asymptomatic spread. So it could be that people can protect themselves from getting COVID, but if they're still able to carry it and spread it to other people, well, at least it's better that they're not gonna get ill themselves, but if they can still spread it to other people, you still, you know, there are limitations there. And we don't know with the current data how long it will protect against infection with a virus. So this could be one of those situations where maybe it's like the flu shot. You need an annual vaccine to make this work, still to be determined. And just to remind people, it does cause side effects, just like other adult vaccines, probably kind of that flu-like achiness, maybe some arm soreness. Some of the initial reports say that it's likely one to two days of illness which they point out could make some people reluctant to take vaccine because people believe if there's any effect that they feel that it can't be good or worth taking. Um, if I could get through the next slide on vaccine, uh, it may answer some questions that I just, and then take questions at that point. So, uh, the, so case in point, FDA has not seen the data. It's only a press release because it's not ready to see it because Pfizer hasn't put it out yet. Uh, and FDA at some point will have to review and vote on it. After that, the CDC and its ACIP group, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, has to review the information and then decide and recommend who the vaccine is best for. And just as we get people's expectations managed, it is unlikely it will be recommended for children at this point because trials on children have not begun here in the U.S. That's not unusual 
because we typically wait for trials to be completed among adults. The problem is now everyone's going, well, how could you not give it to children? This has been long-term public policy on vaccines that they don't want to try vaccines without first seeing how they work on adults. So there's going to be this tension in public policy. Now it's like, well, shouldn't they get it? But going back to the fact that we haven't seen as many cases among children, focusing on adults seems reasonable. And we know that they're working on figuring out how to start thinking about doing those trials among uh, children, but they have to do it um, uh, through FDA uh, processes. And then prioritization would be recommended by CDC and the ACIP about which groups should get it. Typically, if you go on the past uh, recommendations for other events like this, it would be healthcare workers and those most at risk, so those in nursing homes and long-term care facilities would be the first groups for the limited amount of supply and then getting to vaccine supply they remind us initial supplies will be limited even if authorized for the Pfizer vaccine. They were saying perhaps 50 million by the end of 220, uh, the end of 2020. Sorry, it feels like 220. Um, and that number is for the whole world, not just with the US. Uh, and they're anticipating producing up to 1.3 billion doses in 2021. And then vaccine distribution issues, which we're working through even in Arlington and with the state, some of these require ultra cold chain needs. So for the Pfizer vaccine, it requires storage at minus 70 degrees Celsius, which is minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit. So we are working with the state and our partners to see if we can order those uh, now. Other things that the federal government has done successfully, and we hope there will be local uptick, CVS and Walgreens have agreed to help provide with vaccine distribution to long-term care facilities. If those facilities sign up, we've put the information out to those places. When I get that information, we may be making special pleas to anyone that said no, but we can't force them to, but it would be really helpful if some of those things were done in the private sector and taken care of so that public health doesn't have to do all of it. Private providers have also been sent the information and they can sign up, but of course they have to be comfortable with vaccination. And we are planning as a county as well. And the state has told us in general, each health district like Arlington should anticipate um, by a combination of efforts of providing vaccine for about 35% of the population. Not because we couldn't actually give it to 100%, but given people's vaccine hesitancy, and once it becomes plentiful, just like what happened with H1N1, suddenly interest in the vaccine went down. So those are just some of the realities of things. So if we keep saying it's not available, maybe that's the way we would drive more people to it. But people also have the option of, if they feel that it's too new, they don't believe the safety data, no matter what people say, it's perfectly up to them to make those decisions.